I'd start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nation. And I've got a few acknowledgements which I'll come to in just a tick, but I'd like to apologise for being a little bit late. Um, it's one of the vagaries of parliamentary sittings that getting away from Canberra, particularly on the day which is, uh, we now know, not actually the end of the sitting because my House of Representatives in, is in fact going to be sitting again at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Um, and I suspect I won't be able to get there, but uh, it is the last, theoretically, the last sitting day of five weeks of sittings in seven. And uh, things tend to get a bit messy, and they have got very messy uh, this week in Canberra. Uh, but I'd start by acknowledging former Federal Court Justice Shane Marshall, who's with us. Um, and it's great to see you here, Shane. Also, uh, the principal of Sirius College, Ilka Temizkan, the uh, magistrate Catherine Lamble, who I'm told is here, um, Victorian Multicultural Commissioner uh, Chittabaran Srinivasan, uh, and uh, no less than three current and former presidents of the Law Institute of Victoria, starting with the current president, uh, Stephen Sipunsis, uh, and former presidents, the immediate past president, uh, Katie Miller, and uh, former President of the Law Institute, Raina Tang. So welcome all of these dignitaries and other distinguished guests who are here, uh, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, it is in fact a pleasure to be with you here in Melbourne, my hometown, at the end of a very robust week of parliamentary sittings uh, in Canberra. And I'd say one other thing about this week, it may very well be the last ordinary sitting week of this parliament uh, before an election. Uh, if I were in government, I might be in a position to tell you a bit more. I'm not. I'm in opposition. So I, like you, am awaiting some decision from the government. Uh, but it seems at the moment pretty likely that a double dissolution election is going to be called. Can I thank the Australian Intercultural Society for inviting me to speak tonight, and in particular, Armit Keskin, who's worked very hard to make tonight's event possible. Fittingly, as we meet under the auspices of the Intercultural Society, Mr Keskin has asked me to speak about tolerance, multiculturalism and the law. This, I believe, is a deeply important topic. The, the law and the legal profession and the courts exist to serve the Australian community and that community is now defined by its multicultural diversity. We are now unmistakably a multicultural nation. Our law and our legal institutions must reflect that fact. Our legislators, our judges, our lawyers must always be mindful of it. This concerted effort is necessary if all parts of our diverse Australian society are to have confidence that they enjoy, as the Americans would say, the equal protection of our laws. I want to talk about three main issues tonight, but it makes sense to start with the Racial Discrimination Act. In the term of this current parliament, so much of the country's discussion about multiculturalism has centred on that piece of legislation. Centred, in fact, on just one provision of that act, section 18C, which makes racist hate speech unlawful. The current government came to power promising to abolish that protection against hate speech, a commitment that the former Prime Minister, Mr Abbott, had made personally to a particular Conservative columnist. Of course, by the middle of 2013, the government's attack on the Racial Discrimination Act had caused so much uproar right across the country that they were forced to abandon it. I'm very proud that my party stood alongside the Australian community in defending the Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, it's true that I was very vocal in this fight against the abolition of Section 18C or even the amendment of Section 18C, but in no sense did I have to lead that fight. Uh, rather, I saw me, my colleagues, the Australian Labor Party standing shoulder to shoulder with the Australian community. I was very proud 
in fact, to be part of a country where people from all ethnic and national backgrounds of all faiths worked together to defend the tolerant society that we've all built together. A very wide coalition of communities united to oppose the government's attack on the Racial Discrimination Act. Arabs and Jews, Chinese and Indians, Greek and Turkish communities, Australia's original custodians and its newest arrivals, all united to speak for the importance of protecting Section 18C. The government's proposal and the debate that followed was deeply divisive. It caused many Australians legitimate anxiety. And I think it's clear that the government miscalculated the depth and the breadth of community feeling about this particular patch of the Commonwealth Statute Book. It's a salutary reminder for all of us of the importance of the law in the lived experience of Australians of all backgrounds. It was a reminder of the role the law plays in setting a standard, in sending a message about what kind of country we want to be. And importantly, it was a reminder of the significance of the Racial Discrimination Act itself, a 41-year-old statute not otherwise at the forefront of Australians' minds. Some would have us discuss that statute only in the terms of how it applied to one tabloid commentator in 2011. But I think we must remember the significance of the Whitlam government's ratification of the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and the enactment of the Racial Discrimination Act in 1975. When Paul Keating celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Act in 1995, he noted the context in which the Racial Discrimination Act was passed. He said this, it was less than a decade since the referendum which put Aboriginal Australians on the census. It was only a few years since the practice of taking Aboriginal children from their families had ended. The attitudes from which those things flowed was still very common. It has not always been taken for granted in this country that racial discrimination should be illegal. It has not always been taken for granted that people should be protected from hate speech. The Racial Discrimination Act had to be fought for and its enactment was of totemic importance to the project of Australian multiculturalism. It was and is of enormous importance to millions of Australians. As the Indigenous leader Noel Pearson said in his eulogy for Gough Whitlam at the end of 2014, only those who have never experienced prejudice can discount the importance of the Racial Discrimination Act. Our anti-discrimination laws matter. We must continue to protect them. Important though that is, the need for our law to accommodate the needs of a multicultural society goes well beyond the Racial Discrimination Act. That act has been vital, but it is only an ordinary act of parliament. Despite all the progress that we've made in building a tolerant multicultural society, it's an unfortunate fact that injustice and prejudice still lurk in the basic structures of our legal system. The Australian Constitution is the foundational document of that system. Every law is from the authority of the Constitution. In many respects, it's been very successful. It has provided the legal basis for one of the oldest continuous democracies in the world. But we should speak very plainly. Our constitution was drafted by imperfect men in a different time. It was endorsed by an Australian electorate from which many were excluded. The document that they produced, which has endured with very little amendment for more than a century, reflects it. Both expressly and by omission, the constitution still expresses the values of an intolerant, prejudiced past. It's a document that speaks to the possibility of excluding Indigenous people from the vote, but which has nothing to say about the contribution of Australia's First Peoples to our history and to our future. It's a document which gives Parliament the power to make laws about people of a particular race, but which provides no protection against racial discrimination. It's long past time 
that our constitution was brought up to date with multicultural Australia. On my first sitting day as a member of the parliament, the House heard the newly elected Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, apologise to the stolen generations. On that February day in 2008, the Prime Minister proposed, among other things, that this country work towards the further task of constitutional recognition of Australia's Indigenous peoples. We've come a long way since 2008. We are, I believe, close to completing that task. The case for change is undeniable, but there is difficult work to be done. The government must provide persuasive leadership. They must consult broadly and deeply with the Indigenous community. They must formulate a proposal to put to the Australian people which both remedies our, the injustices our constitution presently enshrines and is capable of winning broad support from all sectors of the Australian community at a referendum. If we get this right, and we must, it will be a boon not just for Indigenous, the Indigenous community, but for all Australians. A clear departure from the mistakes of the past and a ringing endorsement of a more tolerant, more inclusive future. I've spoken about the need to protect our anti-discrimination laws and our need to update our constitution to properly reflect the place of Indigenous Australians in our national life. That is, the need to make sure that the substance of our laws, including our most fundamental law, are in accordance with the needs of a multicultural community. But law is about more than what is written in the statute books. Law is not just a set of rules, it is a set of institutions, a set of processes by which we all agree to be governed. And so it's important not only that we get the substance of our laws right, but also that we make sure that the institutions of the law and its processes are accessible to all members of our diverse community. It's important that the institutions of the law reflect the diversity of our community, that those institutions reflect the breadth of Australian life. This is crucial if Australians are to have confidence in our legal system, if they are to trust that whatever their background, they will be treated justly in our courts. Now you're probably thinking I'm going to go on and talk about access to justice, which is a familiar theme for me, or community legal centres or legal aid. I'm sure the three presidents of the Law Institute sitting here would like me to talk about legal aid, but in fact I'm going to talk about something else, which is the way in which we choose judges. And it's something that's, I think, uh, in a sense, just as important as the way we provide legal assistance. In the exercise of his or her traditional responsibility to appoint judges, the Attorney General, and this is at both the federal level and at the state level, the Attorney General has a key role in ensuring that the institutions of the law are led by judicial officers who reflect the diversity of our community. Before the 2013 election, the Law Institute of Victoria, who are here watching closely, all three presidents, uh, the Law Institute of Victoria asked Senator Brandis, who was then the Shadow Attorney General, and me, I was then the Attorney General, how we would promote greater diversity in the judiciary. I outlined Labor's policy on ensuring diverse and transparent judicial appointments, which I'll return to in a second. Senator Brandis, as the aspiring Attorney General in the then opposition, however, responded very flatly. He said this, the coalition believes judicial appointments should be based on merit. That's his answer. There was no, that was a one sentence answer. I'll repeat it. The coalition believes judicial appointments should be based on merit. This, I think, is a disappointing answer. It implies that there is some necessary tension between diversity and merit. And in fact, the two reinforce each other. A diverse judiciary is better qualified for the service of a diverse nation. The appointment of a, of a diverse range of judges shows that a government is serious about seeking out merit, serious and diligent enough to look beyond the narrow band of society 
from which judges have historically been drawn. Australia is blessed with a surplus of talented and principled lawyers and judicial officers increasingly drawn from all backgrounds and walks of life. As Attorney General, during the brief time I had to make some 19 judicial appointments in 2013, I felt spoiled for choice. There has rightly been a lot of attention on the need to appoint more female judges and some progress has been made on this front. In government, more than a third of all of the appointments made by Labor were women, although the current government has regressed badly on this point. Nonetheless, I think it's clear that we must also put serious effort into cultural, racial and religious diversity on the bench. I'm proud that Labor appointed the first Indigenous judge to a federal court. But as I said to the Law Institute of Victoria before the election, there is clearly much more to be done. Labor's approach to appointments should help us in that work. In government, Labor adopted a specific process to guide our appointments to the federal courts. In his time as Attorney General, the first uh, Attorney General in the Labor government, Robert McClelland, established standing advisory panels to consider appointments to the federal court, to the, to the federal circuit court, and to the family court. Vacancies would be publicly advertised for expressions of interest, and the panel would also contact heads of courts and tribunals and various legal professional bodies to seek nominations. The advertisements made clear that the government sought candidates from diverse backgrounds. The panel would consider expressions of interest and nominations and interview candidates as necessary. Following this work, the panel would submit a report to the Attorney General with a list of recommended candidates. The Attorney General would then be well armed to make a recommendation to be considered through the usual cabinet process. Just excuse me. And I can tell you from experience that this process can very greatly assist the Attorney General and the Cabinet in making the right decision. Having a process like this, with a call for expressions of interest, a panel process to consider the people that have come forward, the making of recommendations to the Attorney General, it's a process which I think encourages the Government to consider candidates from a breadth of professional and personal backgrounds. It encourages a diversity of people to put themselves or another person forward for consideration. And this, I believe, is crucial in achieving a more diverse bench. What's more, this process provides candidates, the profession, and most importantly, the broader community with confidence that the government is making appointments from a very well-informed position. It provides an appropriate level of transparency over what remains a very sensitive matter for the Attorney General and the Government. Relevantly for our topic today, the process promotes the consideration of a more varied and diverse range of candidates than may otherwise have come before the Attorney General. The current Government has abandoned this process, which is a shame, I think. I make no criticism of Senator Brandis's various appointments to the Federal Courts to date. Each of the judges Senator Brandis has appointed is eminently qualified. However, I do think that a transparent, consultative process is something of great value. I do think that a real focus on diversity of judicial appointments is vital. If elected to government, Labor will certainly try to do better. We will always treat judicial appointments with the care that they require, of course, but we will recognise that courts must be reflective of the diversity of our community if they are to continue to fulfil that role. Modern, multicultural Australia should expect no less. And I might just pause there to say that I choose the word reflective carefully. I am not for a moment suggesting that the courts of this country should be divided up in some way so as to achieve, this would be the other word starting with R, a representativeness of the community so that we would have a certain proportion of people from a Catholic background or a certain proportion of people from a Muslim background or a certain proportion of people from each of the, in my electorate, 162 nationalities that are, 
that are represented there. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think that that should ever be an objective in the selection of judges. But I do think that when we look at the courts, when we look at the Magistrates Court of Victoria, or when we look at the Federal Circuit Court, or the Family Court, or the Federal Court of Australia, or dare I say it, even the High Court, although that's more difficult because there's only seven judges on the High Court of Australia, when we look at those courts, we should hope to see courts which reflect the community in which we live. And that, because our community is a diverse community, because our community is a multicultural community, demands of us that governments get to a point where the courts also are reflective of a multicultural and diverse community. Uh, the lawyers in this room would confirm that presently that is not the state of the courts of Australia. Um, regrettably, uh, courts still reflect a rather narrow uh, cross-section of our community, although we are improving. I, I had the privilege of appointing the first federal judge from an Indian ethnic background to the Federal Court of Australia, Daryl Rangia, who sits in the Brisbane Registry of the Federal Court, and I hope that attorneys general who come after me will equally be able to point to uh, an extension of the diversity in the federal courts. But it requires something of a deliberate uh, attention to this process uh, and, as I've indicated, adopting a more open process, adopting a process where you call for expressions of interest, adopting a process where there is a great deal of interviewing, uh, a great deal of calling for recommendations from everybody with any interest at all in the court system, which is most of our community, I would hope, uh, is going to produce a better result, a more, a more diverse judiciary uh, than the uh, present fiction being used by the current federal government, which is that the Attorney General of Australia could possibly know all of the people in the field. Uh, that cannot be the case. We are too large a country and there are far, far too many lawyers in Australia for a single, um, a single politician to know all of them. There's about 70,000 lawyers presently in Australia and uh, thousands of them, I would argue, are suitable for appointment to the federal courts and indeed the state courts. Uh, we need to get away from this notion that uh, the Attorney General knows who he or she is able to appoint. So to sum up, I, I've spoken tonight about the importance of the law in nurturing our multicultural society. The importance of defending hard-won reforms which set a standard for tolerance and inclusion and which send a message that prejudice and hate will not be permitted. The, the importance of updating our most basic law, the Constitution. to properly acknowledge the place of Indigenous peoples in Australian life. And the last point I've been making, which is the importance of making sure that the judges who oversee the operation of the law and who lead the legal profession are themselves reflective of the diversity of the Australian community. There are many, many other issues that we could discuss had we the time. The relationship between multiculturalism and the law is and should be broad and deep. Uh, I've participated over the eight years that I've been in the Federal Parliament and the uh, ten or so years before that that I was on the Bar Council um, here in Melbourne or on the Law Council of Australia. Uh, I think I can say from a personal perspective that we are getting better at thinking about how the legal system should accommodate and reflect the nature of our multicultural society. Uh, it's by um, the work of organisations like yours and Armit's very good choice of topic uh, in saying that we need to think about uh, this kind of issue that we will make progress. It has been a very worthy topic and I thank you Armit for selecting it and again I'm very grateful that the Intercultural Society has invited me to speak to it tonight. Thanks very much.